Welcome to Treasury Notes, a show dedicated to the latest news and information from the office of West Virginia State Treasurer John Perdue. I'm your host, Gina Long. Financial education is quickly becoming a key focus of the West Virginia State Treasurer's office, and the office is being recognized on a national level for these efforts. Coming up today, we're going to talk with Lynn Bennett, coordinator for the Treasurer's Net Worth Program, to find out more about the program's many successes. Several other changes and new initiatives are taking place at the State Treasurer's Office. In fact, Treasurer Purdue recently welcomed a new Assistant Treasurer to the team. Here's more. West Virginia State Treasurer John Purdue recently promoted Danny Ellis to Assistant Treasurer. The Logan County native joined the Treasurer's staff in April. Before that, he spent more than 12 years as the business manager at the West Virginia Department of Transportation. Treasurer Purdue says he appointed Ellis to his executive team because of his strong financial background and his great knowledge of state government. Ellis says he's excited to take on the new role. Recently, you know, it, it, uh, the opportunity presented itself to uh, actually to give some real serious consideration to the move, and, and I certainly did. And, uh, you know, having known the treasurer, like I said, for a good number of years, and uh, knowing uh, a little bit of the background of, of you know, the treasurer's office and, and, and also doing a little research of my own about uh, the staff that he currently has and uh, certainly helped me make up my mind to, to make the decision to come to work with the treasurer's office. Before his time with the DOT, Ellis served 11 years as the Logan County Administrator. Prior to that, he spent eight years as the Assistant Comptroller for the Logan Division of the Pittston Company. Ellis replaces Paul Hill, who retired last month after 11 years with the Treasurer's Office. The Treasurer's Office is also pushing forward when it comes to e-government. As we told you last month, e-government provides an electronic payment system for state goods and services. That means people can now use credit cards and electronic fund transfers to do business with the state. E-government did more than $200 million in business during the 2009-2010 fiscal year, which is a milestone for the program. This summer, the Treasurer's Office is working to educate all West Virginians about the functions of the Treasurer's Office through local fairs and festivals. You can check out our website at www.wvtreasury.com for a complete calendar of events. Also, feel free to visit our in informational booth at this year's State Fair of West Virginia in Greenbrier County. The fair runs from August 13th to the 21st. If you're at the State Fair this year, please stop by our booth to check out important information on our Smart 529 College Savings Program. You can also find out if you have unclaimed property while that's waiting for you. And we'll also have new games and prizes this year, so be sure to stop by. In other news, the Net Worth Financial Education Curriculum is now up for its second national award. Treasurer Purdue says he's very proud of that accomplishment. Coming up, we'll talk with the coordinator of the program to explain more about how it works and why it's quickly becoming a national model for financial education. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We find all kinds of items and that becomes unclaimed property and it mounts into millions of dollars. It could be stock, it could be CDs, but it could also be a diamond ring or a gold watch of your dad's. We returned over $50 million to the people of West Virginia. I'm proud of that. You can go on our website, you can look at the names and see if your name's on there or someone that you recognize. We set the standards in a nation in returning unclaimed property Welcome back to Treasury Notes, a show designed to update you on the latest news and information from the office of West Virginia State Treasurer John Perdue. I'm your host, Gina Long. This year, the Treasurer's Office is focusing more than ever on financial education. One of the key initiatives is the Net Worth Program, which incorporates financial learning into every grade level around the state. Joining me here today to talk more about the Treasurer's Net Worth Program is Program Coordinator Lynn Bennett. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you, Gina. Well, Lynn, let's just start by explaining how Net Worth came about and what this program is really all about. Uh, well, for probably over 10 years, the Treasurer's Office and other agencies around the state have been doing financial education to some degree, but it was not 
guaranteed that all students and all teachers could benefit from this program. Uh, the test results in the national assessment did not, re re the results did not indicate that we were being successful. So in 2008, the legislature, uh, at the request of the treasurer and state superintendent, Dr. Payne, uh, provided some seed money to start a program to develop curriculum materials and train teachers. And we're now getting ready to start our phase three of that program. This is a really exciting time, and this program has really been well thought out. It's been a, a very methodical process to get it up and running. Explain uh, how it, the initial phases worked and how that got started. Well, during the first year, we actually identified uh, educators from around the state, different grade levels, different courseware, you know, subject areas, and then also community leaders in the area of finances and financial education. And we worked to develop a set of standards and then we started developing the curriculum materials and we developed what they call instructional guides. And these were published then on the State Department of Education's Teach 21 website. Uh, that was phase one. During phase two, it was a combined pilot program to see if, if we were heading in the right direction. If not, then let's not go all out. And we also then had a research grant to study the, the effects and the impact of what we'd done. So throughout last year, we had about 75 teachers in 32 counties around the state who piloted the net worth materials in their classrooms. We also pre and post tested students and teachers. Uh, and there was significant gain even in a short time and with the weather which took a lot of days away from oh, yeah. the kind of activities we might be doing. Absolutely, we had a lot of snowstorms this right. past winter. And the first semester that the students are in block scheduling did better than the students who had block in the second semester because of the missing days that they just didn't have. But still, we had, we had results, and it's going to take a long time. I mean, this is a 13-year curriculum, right. starting with kindergarten. In kindergarten, they learn about spending and saving. By the time they're, they're seniors in high school, they're learning about investing in the stock market. How did the teachers really play a role in this program? I know, especially in the, these initial phases, but of course throughout the program, they're going to play a role. But in these initial phases, they, they really helped develop this coursework. They helped develop, well, the, te the coursework was totally developed by the teacher educators, the, the first task force and then the pilot teachers. And it went through a very rigorous uh, peer review, was juried, and those that were accepted then were published. Uh, right now we have approximately uh, 60 that either are published or will be published. We have 52 developmental guidance lessons, which was one of the things that makes our state so unique in what we're doing. Are the teachers and the students excited about this program? When, I know you're excited. You know, yeah, they, they actually are. You know, early on, the, I have them in journal each month last year, the, the pilot teachers, and uh, the most common remark was, I never realized how often I could teach personal finance in my math class or my social studies class or my even my science class. It was the realization that it can be integrated and doesn't require them to do one more thing, which teachers absolutely re resent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you talked a little bit about this, but really this program has been so well thought out and you've done testing along the way to make sure that you are headed in the right direction, as you mentioned. Talk a little bit more about um, how you're testing these different phases and what the impact is there. Well, we started off by testing the teachers that were in the pilot group. And they're, um, then at the end of the year, we, we post-tested those same teachers. And there was, the average for the first round was about 72% uh, proficiency. And we, we used the high school test. These are nationally normed tests. Uh, at the, uh, the post-test for the teachers, they were scoring almost in the 80s most of them on the, on the test. So they had gained a lot of knowledge and self-confidence that they could actually teach finance educa education and how they could integrate it. The student results, they varied. We tested K2 uh, and they did exceptionally well. They learned how to, what a check was and they learned how that the safest place to put money is not under your mattress and <laughs> things like that. On the, uh, the testing for grades three through 12, we used nationally normed tests put out by the National Council for Economic Education. And uh, statistically scientific significant gain in all levels, all grade levels, and uh, it's really amazing. So this testing is really proving the point that, it's, that this works. That it works, it's proving the point, and like I said, we, we had committed to doing a, a, a really a high level research project through the funding from the, the council. And so we were able to document that 
you can integrate this in to the regular courseware and students do gain personal finance skills and knowledge. And I think that's one of the, the big keys of this program is it's an integrated program. You're integrating it into current curriculum. It's not a totally separate subject well, for these students. Right. Well, that is a secret. There are only 20 states in the country that have any kind of legislation that requires personal finance. West Virginia is one, but it only requires it at some point in the high school. Okay. We know that we have to start very, very early to build these kind of skills and values into kids about money and what it means. So it's part of the math class in kindergarten. It's part of the history class in fourth grade. It can be integrated and it says, students used to, and I was a former teacher, so students would say, why do I have to know this? Or how am I ever going to use this stuff? Well, we're showing them. We're applying that math to something in the real world. We're applying it to, to checking accounts. We're applying it to investing. We're applying it into income taxes and understanding all those things. And they, it's like, oh, now I need to know this. Right. So it's, that's the concept with the integration. And that's what makes our program really kind of unique because we, as far as I know, we are the only state that has gotten to this point of fully integrating K-12. And the treasurer is very committed to this. And he's very passionate about integrating financial education into the schools. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, the day that I met him. Uh, he said uh, we were talking about what the program might be and he, we were discussing whether I'd be on board or not and his comment was you share my passion. And I believe that passion was there right. and that's what's kind of helped drive me and the others in the program throughout the, uh, the last two and a half years. And, and that passion is also driven by the fact that there was, a, uh, there was kind of a hole in financial education. We haven't really touched on that. Talk about what wasn't there to begin with. Well, what wasn't there was uh, there, there wasn't any real curriculum developed that matched our state standards. Uh -huh. It wasn't part of that. Our state is one of the states that's part of a 21st century learning skills partnership. And if you look at the elements of that, one of them is financial literacy as being that the 21st century student needs that. They can have all the smarts in the world and all the knowledge, but if they can't live successfully, they're not going to be able to really do much with it. So it's, it's one of those elements that's there is financial literacy. Uh, the treasurer saw the need for, I think probably in his position, you see where a lot of need, a lot of our population did not have the skills. We've seen that in the last two years. Mm -hmm. We've seen the level of foreclosures. We've seen the level of, of bankruptcies. We've seen all those high level debts and, and credit card debt. And, and he felt committed to that. Like I said, for the last 10 years, the office has done some training. They've done the Women in Money Conference at the adult level. They've done some teacher training. This program, though, for the first time, is, is part of the state's curriculum, and it's K through 12. It doesn't leave out any student in the state. And your background is education. When you were going into these schools before the net worth program and, and as it was being implemented, did you really see that there was that big lack of financial education? I mean, did you see students who couldn't balance checkbooks oh. that probably at a certain age should know Certain uh, skills. Uh, very, very much. I mean, very basic skills. And I talked to a lot of people early on in the, uh, especially the retail business, mm -hmm. and they would tell me they can't, couldn't find cashiers that could make change. Right. They couldn't find people who could write checks. Uh, a, a real lack of that. And the other thing, of course, is the, the high debt. Even those kids who were college bound would go to college and they would end up walking away from college with twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 in credit card debt. They didn't have the skills to make the choices. And then they spent the first several years of their career trying to deal with that debt. Yeah, and a lot of times technology can, can be a huge help, but it can also be a hindrance. I know students walk around with their phones now and they can do anything, just about anything, anything on their phone, make change, figure out a tip. Do you feel that, that those actually help students or does it kind of hurt them in some ways? Well, I think ways? one of the things that motivated me from the very first part of this program was I was stopping at a McDonald's on the way down to Charleston one day and this little four-year-old girl said, Daddy, Daddy, let me do that, let me do that. And what she wanted to do was to scan the credit card to pay for her Happy Meal. Oh, now, wow. in her mind, that meal had no value except to play with the card. Yes. And then the other thing is I, I ran across a couple of little kids about seven or eight years old who didn't know that there was any money that came from places other than an ATM machine. Really? You put that piece of plastic in and money yeah. comes out. So those are the kind of things. So it's, it's more than just the math and the, and the social studies and the knowledge. It's also the values of understanding that the 
personal finance is really, really important to success. And money is real. <laughs> and money is real, <laughs> yeah. right? And the career choices you make are going to determine how, how you live your life in the future. Well, we also want to touch on the fact that this program, as you said, is really becoming a leader nationally. And in fact, it's one of eight regional finalists for a Council of State Government Innovations Award. How does that, um, how do you feel that this national recognition, uh, what light does it put West, Vir West Virginia in and how does it make us look? I, I guess it's, it's been really surprising to me that we, have advanced that far ahead of others. I mean, I came into this thinking that the whole world should understand that personal finance was important. Sure. But what I'm finding out is that really people understand that, but they have not put the initiative forward. I think what our treasurer did, what Dr. Payne did early on, what others from the auditor's office, attorney general, first lady have done to support it in the legislature, of course, have made a difference in West Virginia. But even even as a, as late as last week at a U.S. Treasury Task Force meeting, they were requesting information about our program oh, wow. from California. Mm -hmm. So you're going to present to this selection committee down in Charleston, South Carolina, um, before they make their final selection. What are you going to tell them about the program? What's your sales pitch? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working on part of that, but, it, but I think in the initial process, it's an innovation, and, it, and the questions they asked were, do you think this is different from what others have done? And do you think it's, it's the right way to, to go? And can it be replicated? And I think that's all of those things are part of our, our program. The other thing I want to I really want to stress is the fact that this is not a one-shot deal. These materials and curriculum materials are part of state curriculum now. If you go to the State Department's website, there's a personal finance button you can click on to find the materials and the lessons. So even if we were to stop today, that legacy is going to be there of what we've created. And I think that's the power behind it. And it's, it's at all levels. So and it's, it's going to take a lot of training and, and development to get it all the way integrated to the schools, but it's there. And being a finalist for this award isn't the first time we've been recognized. Um, back late last year in 2009, we were honored with an Eiffel Award for Excellence in Financial Literacy Education. How did that make you feel to receive that? Oh, award? That, was, that was wonderful. It was the first really acknowledgement beyond our state that, that we were really, really on the right track. And there were people there from China, from other parts of the world, from around the country, and had a lot of chance to talk to them after the awards and they heard what we were doing. And it just sort of boosted it and said, gee, you're doing a good, great job there, keep going. So it was a real plus in that direction. So there was a lot of positive feedback. Oh, absolutely. At this conference. And I think um, a lot of the national leaders in finance are recognizing this program as one of the top-notch programs out there. I, th I think it's getting that kind of recognition. We hope to keep going and, and let people know that we're, we're really, really working at it. Uh, we've had the advantage of the, of the cooperation of so many partners. That's one of the things that net worth is. It's an umbrella. Instead of everybody doing their own little thing, we've been able to bring so many agencies, government, nonprofits, financial institutions, all under an umbrella to work together. Were you surprised to see the national recognition of this program coming so quickly down the pike? Yeah, in a sense I was because I think we're still in a developmental stage. Mm -hmm. And having it come so fast was, was, you know, kind of surprising. This program, we've done several reports about net worth and the Get a Life game, the, which is the middle school component of the net worth program. Talk a little bit about some of these different components and what they really allow the students to learn and, and how many of them, like the Get a Life game, are hands-on activities. Well, the Get a Life game is, is actually one of the developmental guidance activities and in parent involvement in the middle school level. Uh, those are the kind of activities that get the students actually involved in doing things uh, and, and the realization that they can, that money makes a difference, that there are decisions to be made. Get a Life is a perfect example of that where the students have to determine whether or not they want to buy the cell phone, HDTV, all the extra stuff that goes with it, or pay the bills. <laughs> and sometimes they find out that they need, you know, had one little girl come to me and she, I was working the utilities desk. And, I had convinced her to buy a cell phone and, I don't know, high-end broadband cable and all those kind of things. And she was totaled up and she didn't have enough money for all that. And she looked at me and she goes, I better go to college. <laughs> and she went back and got a new career that paid a lot more money. When she came back to me then, I thought I could still sell her all this stuff. Sure. She said, no, I think I want to save some money now. 
So in that one hour, right. there was a lesson, something that, that struck with her. At the elementary level, we're talking very basically about parents and students working together, some activities to understand money. Uh, part of it is in the curriculum, part of it is in the guidance part. At the high school level, one of the examples is uh, an activity called uh, Super Senior, Super Expensive Year. And it involves a parent and a student and juniors in high school sitting down and looking at the actual cost of the senior year in high school, which is phenomenal in some cases, right. and developing a budget and then how it's going to be paid for. That's got to be a huge awakening for a lot of yeah, students and their parents, oh, probably. Right, and, and they so, don't realize how much they're they're spending. Right, and so it's you know, it's, and so at the end of the activity, it says, you know, and, and who's going to pay for this? So then it comes to the realization that maybe I need to work this summer, maybe I'll go see Grandma and see if she'll help. Right, yeah, the funds. Just the idea that life is expensive, it doesn't all come free. Yeah, and that's my, my other question to you is how are these students reacting? How are the parents reacting to this type of program? I really haven't had a lot of parents' feedback, some, but the students are real excited. I mean, I get the, like I said, we did, uh, each of my 75 teachers journaled each month and gave a reflection of what was happening in their classroom. And we got some really, really nice comments and responses back. And then watching the kids in some of these activities like Get a Life, they are just so engaged and in and, and, and doing these things. And they love it. And it's it's because it's something real. You know, it's not adding apples and oranges, it's adding dollars and pence and cents. And that's real life to them. And you were talking a little bit about going back to the Get a Life game, um, students having the opportunity within the game to go back to college, see what they can do with an education, see how they can make more money. And then after they're doing that, they're making wiser decisions, which I'm sure is very refreshing for you to see. But I know that there's there are a lot of community members who are volunteering at these booths, and they're they're pushing the expensive stuff. They're not right. getting it. It's not an easy game for these kids Getting to go right. through. And I guess you know, calling it a game, it really is a simulation yes. of of real life. And when they, yeah, you know, their first time they go through it, they're given a, a, an occupation that does not have post secondary. It doesn't have to be college. It could be other right. post secondary training. And the income that would go with it, and they're told how many children they have, and what kind of a house, and what car. And then there's the extras. We try to sell them at these little booths, and they can't afford any of those, by the way, <laughs> and get through. So the realization is that that, the high, that they need more education, and and it, it really is an important part of education now is that they need to get the more education, the more training, and make good career choices. Because like again, like I said, you can't just come out of high school these days and make the same kind of money that maybe you did years ago in manufacturing or mining when there was a lot of jobs there. Very quickly, do you think, just my final question, do you think that this is part of part of the solution on, on a statewide and national level to get our economy back on track? Oh, I, I, I think so. I think we have generations that, that have, spent, have learned to spend and not necessarily save and make some wise decisions. And I don't want to say that, that, that they need to some of those values that aren't being instilled in generations down the way. We're starting here saying that to kids very early on, it's this is important to you. And if we spiral it up through 13 years of, of this knowledge and skills, then they're going to come out being better citizens. All right. Lynn Bennett, coordinator of the Net Worth Program, thank you so much for joining us here thank today. Thank you. We'll be right back with more news and information. Stay with us. The primary function of the treasurer's office is cash management. People don't realize that we are the largest bank in the state of West Virginia. People have no idea how much money comes through the treasurer's office. Over $13 billion now. I pride myself in being the best state in managing money in the nation. I'm the banker of state government. We are your bank. We take care of your money. To Treasury Notes, I'm your host, Gina Long. From the capital market to building improvements, this summer is already proving to be a busy one here at the state capitol. Greg Stone has more in this report. A typical summer day at the state capitol can offer a cornucopia of sights and sounds if one is willing to look and listen. Just grab a bag. On this Wednesday, capital market at the capitol made a visit allowing employees and vendors to buy a selection of products. 
In the center courtyard, the soothing center fountain provided the backdrop as employees had lunch. Elsewhere, workers continued pressure washing the limestone of the Capitol and applying sealant around individual blocks. A close view of already pressure washed limestone shows the effort has been a success. The cleaning is part of millions invested in restoring lights, brass, and other assets. Indeed, our state's capital contains more adventure than meets the eye. All right, thanks to Greg Stone for that report. Before we go today, the Treasurer's Office would like to take a moment to celebrate the life of U.S. Senator Robert C. Byrd and say thank you for his years of service to our state and our nation. The Senator passed away June 28th at the age of 92. Again, a big thank you to Senator Robert C. Byrd. Well, that wraps up today's show. Remember, you can always get the very latest news, information, and events from the State Treasurer's Office on our website. That web address is www.wvtreasury.com. There you can also get a schedule of our fairs and festivals events that we will be at for the remainder of the summer. And remember to stop by our booth at the State Fair. The State Fair this year is August 13th through the 21st. We want to welcome you to our booth. It's in the West Virginia building and there will be lots of games and prizes and much information for you to take in at that booth. So please be sure to stop by and see us there. I want to thank Net Worth Coordinator Lynn Bennett for joining us here today. I also want to thank Jason Philibon, Eric Tolbert, and Greg Stone for their contributions to today's show. And thanks to the West Virginia Library Commission for technical direction, keeping you informed on the Library Television Network. I'm Gina Long with the West Virginia State Treasurer's Office. Thanks for joining us.